Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another session of Adventure Canada in Conversation. It's uh, my pleasure to be the host. I'm Bill Swan, uh, co-founder of Adventure Canada. And uh, it is also my great pleasure to be welcoming back by popular demand, uh, Mr. Tom Muir, uh, who is going to be uh, with us today in conversation. Uh, Tom is an Orkney Island folklorist, a native storyteller, author, and historian. He is also the exhibitions officer at the Orkney Museum in Kirkwall. And for over three decades, storytelling has taken Tom traveling to other communities, universities, and festivals to share his passion for the subject. Born in the Orkney, Tom lives in Stromness with his American-born wife, Rhonda, who has created their Orkneyology.com website. It's a great resource to learn more and plan a visit to the Orkneys. So together in 2019, they also launched the Orkney Folklore Trail app, designed to help folks explore the trails, places, and folklore of the magical Orkney Islands. Um, today, uh, what we're going to be focusing on is the, uh, the life and times of uh, explorer and Dr. John Ray, uh, who was a um, native Orkney Islander and uh, was one of the most successful uh, Arctic explorers of his time. And uh, we're also commemorating um, uh, his birthday week. Um, John would have been 207 today. And when you hear about his physical uh, achievements, it, it would be no surprise if he was actually alive at 207 with what he was able to do. So Tom, welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you back. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because John Ray is a hero of the Adventure Canada clan. And uh, I just, uh, I'm and thr thrilled and enthralled by his his life story. So, Tom, nice, welcome. Nice to be back, Bill. Yeah. So, um, what's it like there in Orkney today? Are you into the fall yet? Is it uh, is it weathering in, or are you still enjoying a a, a nice uh, fall day? It's uh, it's a bit mixed. So, there's been some nice days. It's been quite sunny, and today is a bit more overcast and. Small, you know, short showers. So, more oh, wonderful. Like. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, John Ray, um, I know you've spent a great deal of time studying his life and um, helping others to understand his life. Um, mm. You know, it's uh, it's just such a fascinating story in terms of uh, the way he went about business, uh, his character. Can you tell us about uh, his early life in Orkney? What uh, what shaped the man? Well, he was born in the parish of Orford, which is just across the bay here from Stromness, um, on the 30th of September, um, 1813. And his father was a factor for an estate, so he was like the, the, the manager of a, a large estate. But John, when he was a, a, a small boy, was given a musket to go shooting with when he... He said he was so small he couldn't lift it up. They had to have it propped up on a stick. He was about five years old. You know, I don't know what health and safety would do these days, but it set him on that path because he loved to go hunting and he loved to walk and he paid no attention to what the weather was like. Um, and his stamina was outstanding. I mean, he could outpace people considerably younger than him and continued to do that until old age. In his late 70s, he, he walked 40 miles uh, thinking that it was nothing, you know. There's no point in getting a cab back, I'll walk, you know. Uh, his, he was, had a, an a incredible stamina, um, but he was also a very skilled hunter. So these were all things which um, stood him in good stead when he went to the Arctic to explore. Yeah, yeah. And um, he wasn't just a, an explorer, hunter, and author. Uh, a, a, astonishingly, he became a, a doctor at the age of 19, did he not? Yeah, he went and studied medicine in uh, Edinburgh University. It would have been just after the Burke and Hare trial, you know, where the, the body famous body snatchers who weren't body snatchers they were murderers actually it was easier to kill people than dig up a grave 
but they were supplying the university where he studied with bodies for dissection. Um, but he discovered that if he studied surgery in the Royal College of Surgeons, he could graduate at 19 instead of 20. And so that's what he did. So he became a surgeon. And by 19, he was a, a fully qualified surgeon. Uh, er, early signs of his level of ambition. The, um, uh, and the next uh, indication of that ambition was his willingness to explore. He signed on with the Hudson's Bay Company, did he not? Well, the idea was that his father was an uh, agent for the Hudson Bay Company who employed um, about three quarters of their workforce from Orkney. Mm. It was a means of escaping grinding poverty here. Um, and also the fact that you, you know, you couldn't better yourself because that didn't exist. There was no way that you could leave your social position. Um, if you were born a crofter, you died a crofter. So this was a way of making some money. And, uh, and, but many of them stayed marrying First Nation women and, and staying and raising families. But his father suggested that he sign on for one journey on the ship, the Prince of Wales, um, <clears throat> in 1833, when he was still 19, he was turned 20 that year. And um, the idea was that they would sail over to Canada and then he would sail back as surgeon on board the ship. But the ship got iced in, the, the ice came early that year and they were trapped in James Bay. So um, he remained at Moose Factory and then signed on because he found Canada to be fascinating. It was everything, it was all the challenges that, that he relished. Mm. Yeah, and it's a story that would eventually involve the weavings of um, Sir John Franklin and Lady mm. Franklin and even Charles Dickens. Uh, so that first year, that one year contract eventually becomes 21 years. What was that first year like for, for Ray? What, what, do you, what do you think that first winter of being iced in must have held for him? He learned a lot during that time because the men on the ship were starting to suffer from scurvy. And he was out walking and uh, they were on a small island um, in James Bay. And he noticed that where he'd stood, it looked like patches of blood on the ground. So he studied that because he thought, I don't think I've cut my foot. It doesn't feel like I'm bleeding. So he looked at it and he discovered those cranberries under the snow. So he gathered the cranberries and he fed that to the men and it, it, it turned them. They got the vitamins and the scurvy subsided. But um, the captain of the ship and the first mate both died of scurvy during that winter. And Ray recognized it was because they were drinkers. Um, he had refused the alcohol because he said that he had nothing against it, but it was just that he didn't feel that he needed it. And it was more advantageous to be given to people who actually needed it more or being kept as a sort of a, a, a medicine and, and also a liniment as well he was saying so um if you didn't drink it you got it rubbed into you so he um he had not taken the alcohol but he noticed that these men drank more than the rest and they suffered more with scurvy vitamins weren't known about at that time yeah yeah um so but he learned from that and also probably one of the most important figures in ray's life in canada was a man called george rivers who was a cree first nation and he had suffered an injury when he was younger he had a severe injury to the spine so Although he was over six foot tall, he was about five foot three because he was bent over. Um, he had this very, you know, crooked back. 
because of an injury, but he was an expert hunter. Now, Ray was a very good hunter, but George Rivers taught him the way that the Cree hunted, which was different from what he was used to. And uh, so he learned a lot from him and it set him on that mindset that the indigenous people really know what they're talking about because they've been there for a long time and there's nothing that we can teach them, but they can teach us a lot about survival. And I think that was the most important thing for that first year. And it, beco and it becomes a, 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 you know, a, a strong attribute of his entire character and experience going forward. Now, uh, is that first winter lead to his first book? And, and what about his passion for, for mapping? I mean, um, he must have, you, you've mentioned he gets out walking quite a bit in that first winter. Uh, does, does he go home and write a book or wh where, where does the, the, the authorship start to come in? No, he, uh, <clears throat> he agrees to sign on as a surgeon. And among the things that he learns from George River is, is George Rivers is how to um, walk on snowshoes, which is hugely important to him then, later on. And also uh, the use of small sleds that, that they used. Um, so he would walk for over a hundred miles to attend to uh, Cree First Nation family who were ill, for instance. Um, everybody in that area was looked after by him as a doctor, regardless of, of their ethnicity. Uh, and he just seen people as being people. Um, but so he, he works there for a while. This is 1833, 1834. And it's not until 10 years later that he um, is, his reputation for being able to walk on snowshoes for hundreds of miles and living off the land uh, because of his hunting skills comes to the attention of Sir George Simpson, the, uh, the governor of the Hudson Bay Company in Canada. And he decides that Ray is the man <clears throat> to continue and finish off the mapping of the Arctic coastline of Canada, which he wants for the honor of the Hudson Bay Company. He wants them to finish off, not the Royal Navy. And so uh, Ray is sent with um, three First Nation people and another Orkney man called uh, John Corrigal. They set off by canoe from, uh, well, walking and canoe from Moose Factory down to the Red River Settlement, where he is to be taught uh, how to survey. And when he arrives there, he discovers that the man who is going to teach him is actually on his deathbed. So <clears throat> after he dies, um, Ray decides that they'll set off to Salt St. Marie. And they walk. 1200 miles and when he reaches there he uses snowshoes john corgill doesn't he thinks it's ridiculous it, tom tom can you stop mm -hmm. did you just say he walked and snowshoed 1200 miles yeah 1200 miles. One, 1200 miles um was the was the journey it was pretty bad weather um so it took him about two months. My goodness. And yeah. 1,200 yeah. miles in two months. So he, he gets there and he weighs himself. Uh, and John Corrigal weighs himself. Now, Corrigal hasn't used snowshoes. He is down by 24 pounds in weight. But Ray has put on two pounds. Uh, so instead of, instead of starving along the way, because they were hunting and, and um, he actually put on weight. So, Excellent. Um, to get in the mood today, in fact, I, uh, I snowshoed to our interview just to, you know, to get in the frame of the John Ray mindset. There's no snow yet, so it was particularly difficult moving through the forest. But uh, I persevered. I started around 4 a.m. And, and, and arrived. So, uh, I would have given, given the Sasquatch something to laugh about.
Yes, indeed. <laughs> now, the, at the same time, you've already mentioned that the, the you know the competition between the Admiralty and and the uh, Hudson's Bay Company in terms mm. of exploration. It, this is about the era in which the uh, the the uh, drive for finding a uh, water passage through the Northwest Passage is uh, is going full bore and enter Franklin to the equation, um, which probably is the polar opposite to Ray's approach to understanding uh, indigenous ways in, in the landscape and on, on the water. Can you tell us, um, Tom, about uh, Ray's expedition with Richardson in search of, uh, of Franklin and, the, and his men? Well, Ray, led four expeditions in the Arctic, uh, and it was after the first one that he actually wrote his book on the, his travels. Um, but he was never comfortable as a writer. But when he returned to London, he had been so successful uh, in that overland journey that Sir John Richardson asked him to be his second in command on the expedition to search for Franklin. Once Richardson had left and gone back to Britain, Ray carried on with the expedition as leader. So he was, um, he, he led half of that expedition. But um, the, the big difference between what Ray was doing and what Franklin was doing um, was that the Admiralty had decided that science had the answers to everything. So if you had lots of scientific equipment and such like, and you modified ships with uh, steam engines, then you could go wherever you wanted. Um, and so, you know, having 130 people on two ships, um, Ray knew that that was not a good idea. He only traveled with maybe half a dozen people. Yeah. And then he would maybe leave some of them at one area and he would set off with maybe two other guys um, because he knew that the Arctic could not support the large number of people. So, but his first expedition, he built a stone house, which is the sort of thing that he would have been familiar with coming from Orkney, we, we build in stone. And... Um, so they built this house called Fort Hope and uh, almost froze to death. But then he went and visited some Inuit who had made igloos and made snow houses. And he went inside and his frozen jacket, which had been frozen for about three weeks, started to defrost. And he thought, there's something in this. So he learned from them how to make snow houses and also about caching food as well under piles, cairns of stone. Uh, and this is what he used on his expeditions because the snow houses were still there on the way back during the winter, so he could reuse them. And of course, he was storing food, caching food along the way. So uh, he was able to, uh, to survive quite easily. Uh, well, I mean, it was tough, of course, but he was able to survive in the Arctic. Now, at the same time, Tom, the uh, the, the British uh, naval world is going crazy as they as they've lost Franklin, and uh, now they become quite obsessed. Uh, Multi-decade search is uh, beginning in terms of trying to find the fate of the expedition, and uh, Ray is critically involved in this search, is he not? I mean the uh, the next outing, he begins to um, start to understand maybe what has happened uh, to Franklin and his men. Well, nobody had a clue yet as to where they were and uh, or what had happened. Um, on the third expedition, which was in search of Franklin, he, he actually found the first piece of evidence, mm. um, which was part of a flagstaff that had a piece of a silk flag still attached to it, just shreds of fabric, but it showed that, you know, that this is, um, had been a, a flagstaff. And okay, crucially as well on the flagstaff, there was the broad arrow, which is stamped on all military uh, pieces. So the Royal Navy and the Army, you know, they use these arrows, just three, you know, um, 
three points, three three lines, just a little a little triangle and a little line coming down from it. Um, but that showed that it was Royal Navy and uh, not from, say, a whaling ship. And um, that was not in the area where it was. They were, you know, they were expecting it to be really. Uh -huh. But the his fourth expedition, um, he didn't think that he was going to find anything about Franklin because he was in completely the wrong area. They were all searching much further to the west. Uh -huh. um, so the area that he was going to was nowhere near where Franklin was meant to be. But that is where they started to find evidence. This is the uh, the ill-fated boat drag um, mm. uh, that he starts to find the remnants of. Is that correct? Yeah, it was on King William Island, mm -hmm. which at that mm -hmm. time was called King William Land because they thought it was a peninsula. Now, when Ray was <clears throat> was traveling in that area, he met an Inuit hunter called Inuk Pusichuk. And he had offered to go along with Ray and, uh, and help out with hunting and things, supplying food. He was happy to, to accept his offer. But he noticed immediately that something was strange about this guy because on his cap, he was wearing a piece of ribbon which had gold trim on it. And he recognized that as coming from a naval cap. Um, and he asked him where he got it from. And he said, oh, well, it's, it was from the place where the white men died. Hmm. And he said, well, you know, where was that? Oh, I don't know. I traded it with someone else. So Ray was able to trade it from him. And he said, if you know anyone else that has any relics, any things like this, belonging to these white men, um, we are going to be at Pelly Bay. So come down there and, uh, and bring anything with you and we will, we will trade for it. And when he got back to Pelly Bay, having discovered Ray Strait, which is another story, of course, it was uh, turned out King William uh, King William Land was King William Island. And the fact that there was fresh ice forming in the strait showed that it had been open mm -hmm. um, during the summer. And, um, and so new ice was forming, which meant that the dense park ice had come down so far but had not penetrated into that channel, um, which meant open water. And he would have known that that would have been a link, a navigable link in the Northwest Passage, uh, although he never made the claim himself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, he discovered that with his interpreter, uh, uh, Inuit uh, man called Will William Oligbuck, and also uh, an Ojibwe First Nation man as well, Thomas Mistigan. So the three of them from very different cultures were the three men that, that looked upon this called Ray Strait. On returning to Pelly Bay then, he discovered that there was lots of Inuit there with artifacts from the Franklin expedition. Now, some of the artifacts were identified as being, you know, things like forks and knives belonging to the officers because they had the crest stamped on it. But Ray didn't know what, you know, Franklin's crest was or James Crozier's crest was. Um, but when he had uh, a medal presented to Franklin with Franklin's name on it and all the pieces of silverware with Franklin's name on it, um, it could only be from that expedition. Must, it must have been quite a day of discovery for him. In terms of what he knew the attention would be uh, back home. How are, how are these discoveries, these gradual discoveries over four expeditions being received back in Britain? Well, the first expedition, <clears throat> of course, Franklin had set off 
the year before that expedition. So uh, everything was still fine. Uh, everything was hunky dory in the Arctic, you know, nobody was worried. Uh, but Ray had actually traveled such distances on foot and, um, and using small boats as well, that he was lionized in London as, as a hero, you know, uh, which is what brought him to Richardson's attention. So he was the darling of London. Um, and then, you know, he had made these other two expeditions, hadn't really found anything apart from the flagstaff on the third one, which was kind of overlooked, really. But then it was the fourth expedition, which just cemented his fate, really, because um, the with William Ulligbuck, the translator, uh, Inuit translator, he was transcribing the uh, evidence that the Inuit people were giving to them. Mostly it was, we don't know where this place is, but there was a place where there was a group of white men who died pulling a boat. They starved to death. And uh, the, some Inuit had met them and had given them some seal meat, but they didn't have enough to keep a group of people alive you know they were living hand to mouth feeding their own family they couldn't take on a bunch of strangers um but they had gunshots later which they thought they were shooting at geese who were returning um but then they found the the bodies and they found that some of the bodies had been cut up and the contents of the kettles that was used for cooking um, had human remains in it. So they'd resorted to cannibalism, um, eating the dead in order to try to stay alive, yeah. which is something that Ray understood because he'd heard stories of people faced with the same thing. Um, it was a tragedy. Um, so af one after another, the same story is being told. There's no specific place as to where it is because all these people have traded on the artifacts. They've traded them from people who maybe traded them from somebody else who was outside. So no first-hand accounts. Um, it was only much later that he actually got a handle on where this place was. But by which time... Um, the winter was set in again and he would have to overwinter in the Arctic for another year to be able to travel in the winter to, you know, get to King William Island, to be able to cross Ray Strait. And uh, some of his men were suffering from frostbite. And he also knew that there was lots of ships being dispatched by the Royal Navy and that there were many people in the Arctic searching for Franklin. And he wanted to go back and, and say, look, I'm sorry, but they're all dead. So you're risking people's lives looking for dead men. Well, um, didn't, didn't in fact uh, more uh, personnel die looking for Franklin than actually died from the expedition? I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it's, um, there were a, a huge number of expeditions. It wasn't just one or two. I mean, it was yeah, dozens. Yeah, yeah. And well, over the, a very long period of time. The, 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 he goes back with this news, uh, somewhat walks into it. Um, mm. he, he, he does explain the cannibalism, but apparently he, he not soft sells it, but he tones it down in his report. Uh, that might uh, go for public consumption, but for some reason, the more graphic full report gets released. Who who does that, and why did that happen? Well, the Admiralty have released the report. He wrote a report for the Hudson Bay Company for his employers hmm. and for the Admiralty. So it's basically it's the same report. He never intended for it to be made public. Okay. That was never his intention. He wrote a letter to the Times 
saying that, you know, he was the bearer of sad news that, you know, he had discovered that the last members of the Franklin expedition had died pulling a boat um, across a, an island, trying to make their way down to a river, which they could then head down and, uh, and come to maybe a Hudson Bay Company trading post and safety. But it wasn't to be. He, he wanted to spare the family of these people the, the horrors of the, the story of cannibalism. I have a theory, which is only my theory, might not be right, but Lady Franklin at that time was a real thorn in the side of the Admiralty. She had taken uh, lodgings just across from Admiralty House, and she, they called it the battery because she was firing off salvos at them constantly uh, and demanding more and more searches to be made. And... Um, I think that they just wanted to shut her up. Also, they actually had something to do now because they're, you know, after the Napoleonic Wars, there wasn't a fat lot happening in the way of needing a navy. Um, but then you had the Crimean War had just started. So they were taking out armies over to, uh, to the Crimea. Um, and... Uh, they they just wanted this woman to shut up and go away, yeah, and yeah. they greatly underestimated her because they um, they decided to release this, thinking well, it shows that the whole expedition ended up in disaster, and then she'll go away, and we won't hear from her again. In fact, it had the opposite um, effect because she wanted to vindicate her husband to clear his name of any suggestions, any taint of cannibalism, um, and also to have him um, as the discoverer of the Northwest Passage. Uh, right. She wanted, she had an eye on, on his um, future reputation. And she started to make a, a kind of a uh, a hero, you know, of, of this man. And um, and then Ray, of course, coming along with this stuff, um, this story was not what she wanted to hear. And she basically went to war. Um, and she was a woman who was very well connected. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Ray ends up being the only Arctic explorer of his age who didn't receive a knighthood. And, and didn't receive invitations to all the nice parties, you know. He was persona non grata in London. And, uh, it's astounding when, when you consider his achievements in Arctic exploration. Um, mm. There's a wonderful map on your orkneyology.com of just the places that he explored on those four expeditions and the distances covered, mm -hmm. uh, uh, prim you know, primarily on foot and small boat. So it's amazing that that recognition wasn't uh, bestowed to him. Now, at this point with Lady Franklin, Franklin so, um, you know, determined to rub this uh, theory out, uh, Charles Dickens enters the story. What happens there? Well, Dickens is the editor of a magazine which he owns called Household Words. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> this is a good way of keeping um, of, you know, selling copy. So he has, he publishes the, uh, you know, the, the report from Ray and well, he refers to it and, um, uh, and to f start with, he, he kind of exonerates Ray from any, because he was, just stupid enough to believe what the Inuit told him without questioning it, which was not true. He actually had interviewed many, many people um, and critically looked at all the evidence and it was the same story coming up. But um, he says that he can go and take his rest and all that, though he had no guilt attached to him. He can take his rest like a true Englishman, he says. And I think that there's a little barb in that because, of course, Ray was, <laughs> was Scottish. But, um, 
But then he goes on uh, to launch a really vicious racist attack against the Inuit. Uh, and then Ray retaliates by defending the Inuit, saying they are a truthful people. Um, and this is, you know, I have spent years in the Arctic. I know these people and I respect them and I trust what they say. And uh, so this, of course, is more fuel for Dickens because then he gets a chance to do another reply to that, which keeps people buying the magazine. So, you know, from that point of view, it's really done as a sort of a, a marketing measure. You know, he's, he's getting the good juicy stories. He writes a big piece about this. He writes another big long article about <laughs> situations where English people didn't eat each other, but foreigners did, especially the French, oh, you know. So there's all yeah. these stories of, you know, well, they did it, but we wouldn't, because that's not the done thing. It's not the way that we would do that, you know. Um, chingoistic rubbish, but, you know. Uh, uh, this shameful defamation process deepens in terms of, you know, eliminating some of Ray's accomplishments and uh, mm. and uh, writing him out of uh, the history process in a way, does it not? Well, Leopold McClintock went to see Ray and Ray got the maps out and showed him where the boat place was. Mm. I mean, he was asked to go back, lead another expedition to the Arctic and to go to that place. Uh, and Ray, and Ray refuses. Um, he makes the excuse that he's getting a bit too old now and he wants to marry and settle down, um, <clears throat> which he, he, he does. But um, it's interesting that Tagak Curley, who is an Inuit politician, I mean, you, you're sure that many of the, uh, your listeners will, will know of Tagar, if not know him personally. Yes. Um, he says that he felt that Ray was worried about the fact that that was a taboo area and there was bad magic in that area and he was afraid of it. And that is actually backed up with a lot of uh, what Ray says himself about, he had a, a nurse from the Highlands when he was a kid that used to tell him ghost stories. And it scared the living bechebus out of him. Uh, and he said that, you know, these nurses shouldn't be allowed to do that because he says, still by a campfire, you hear the cry of an owl or something, a screech and, and your blood runs cold, you know. So, and he, he talks about another, uh, haunted building that was uh, near where he was born that they could see lights at night in it and, and it was meant to be the ghosts of, of the uh, the old laird that lived there in fact it was smugglers signaling to the other guys at sea that the coast was clear to come in with the with the smuggled um, rum and well uh, brandy and chin um, so he was a man who did have a great deal of superstition yeah. Whether that's right or not, I don't know, but that's what Tagak's take on it was. But he refused to go back, but he did show McClintock where the place was from later when people came in who had some knowledge of where this actually was, where this boat place with the dead bodies were. McClintock went there and found exactly what he was told to expect. And then he comes back and he is the discoverer of the fate of Franklin. Oh. And um, Lady Franklin manages to get, uh, she kind of bullies and browbeats the, uh, the establishment in Westminster Abbey to, uh, to put up a memorial. Uh, well, a plaque, it's meant to be a plaque. Now you can have a small relief picture on it, you know, just a small medallion sort of thing. Instead of that, she goes with a full, huge bust of the man. You know, it's not a plaque, it's a memorial. And it says, discoverer of the Northwest Passage. It's John Franklin. Um, and the, uh, you know, Tennyson um, pens this, these 
famous lines, you know, they forged the final links with their lives. Tennyson was Franklin's nephew, you see, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Um, so when you've got Dickens and Tennyson against you, I mean, Ray, who was a man that was never very comfortable writing, I mean, he kind of stood no chance. Um, yeah. What McClintock had found was the only written document. And uh, so, and in that, it says that, you know, Franklin had died early on in the expedition, which removes him from the whole horror of cannibalism. Yes. And so Lady Franklin's happy. So he gets a knighthood and he gets a plaque underneath Franklin's, beneath Franklin's plaque on Westminster yeah. Abbey. And the glory of the empire continues with uh, no, no uh, sordid tales. Uh, just, in just so. Yeah, yeah. Now, Taggart Curley, you had an interesting story about um, an encounter he has with uh, uh, Charles Dickens, is it great grandson? Great, great grandson. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> this is the, the wonderful thing that um, Ray's reputation as being kind of rehabilitated at the moment because the Admiralty attributed some of their discoveries as well, um, some of Ray's discoveries to their men, men who were never in the area. And Ray actually had a, a fight with them to have his name put on maps. Um, so, you know, he kind of felt that he was being marginalized and, and his discoveries were being pushed out. And so they were, I mean, he doesn't appear in the history books, you know, about the Arctic. He's, he's a non-person. I mean, Lady Franklin did a number on him that Stalin would have been proud of, you know. But then, I mean, we have, in Orkney, we have always known about Ray. We've spoken about Ray. We've had exhibitions about Ray. I've written exhibitions about Ray. The National Museum did a big exhibition called No Ordinary Journey in 1993, which was the centenary of his death. And um, then Ken McGugan wrote the, the excellent book, Fatal Passage, yes. telling the story of, of Ray. And then uh, John Walker, a uh, filmmaker from Halifax, he bought the rights to the book and made a film called Passage, which I'm on, among other people. Uh, so that's when I first met Ken and then met Tagak as well. Do you, do you play John Ray in that film, Tom? <laughs> no, um, I don't. Just between you and me, Bill, it seems nobody else is listening. I don't really have the physique for it. Ah, uh, yes, but, but the voice, Tom. The but, voice, not the voice, man. <laughs> we, don't know, we don't know what he sounded like. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Before, well, not before recordings, but very, you know, recordings would be very rare. He may have had quite a squeaky voice, who knows. But, yeah, um, know. but when John Walker was making the film, he, he phoned me up one night. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I was, you know, so who's phoning you this time? And it was John, and he was flying and from some small um, town to Yellowknife making the film. And he said, Tom, I've got to tell you this. I've got to tell you. I was in this bar and there's this guy next to me. And he said, who are you? You know, kind of what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm, I'm making a film about John Ray. And the man's face lit up and he said, John Ray, he loved the dog rib. Get the man a drink. And uh, suddenly all these guys, all these First Nation guys were all buying him drinks, you know, because uh, they knew Ray and they respected and admired him, which was wonderful. But um, there was still that old um, issue with the Charles Dickens, you know, what he said and against the Inuit. So we were invited as part of that film to go to a sound studio in Shepherd's Bush and read a draft of a film, uh, a movie made on the life of Ray, uh, based on on the discovery of the fate of Franklin, uh, which sadly was never made, but John Walker still has the rights to that. So if anybody's like a money that they don't want, I can get in touch with John. It would be a fantastic film. But anyway, we were there as experts, 
And um, so we're all sitting there, we're copying the script. The actors who had been on the docudrama, so, you know, it was period costume and all that as well. The, all the crew, all they're sitting there reading the script, all the cast, I should say. And they're reading the script. And then the guy who plays Dickens says, well, I don't understand. Is it Charles Dickens, who is the the champion of the underdog? I mean, why is he siding with the establishment against Ray? Yeah. And Sean says, well, I don't know, but there's somebody here who might be able to tell you. Uh, and he introduced Gerald Dickens, who was the great great grandson of Charles Dickens. And, oh, good. Uh, well, I would love to have been in that room. Oh, it was amazing! And so he's sitting there, and they're talking about you know the uh, about Dickens. Tagax up on his feet. Your grandfather insulted my people. He, I think, he starts off by saying, "Hello, I'd like to introduce myself." I'm one of those savages that your grandfather wrote about. Oh <laughs> and he was kind of like, oh, you know. And Tagak was really upset. And what you don't see on the film is that they actually had a break there. They stopped filming. And um, I spoke to Gerald in the break and I said, look, you know, he's actually serious. Because he was kind of going, oops, sorry, you know, oops. And I said, no, he's actually serious. Um, this is something that is a real heart to him and his people. Mm -hmm. And that I believe in Inuit culture, and I might be wrong, um, but I had heard that these disputes can go on for generations, but if someone apologizes at any point, it's over. It could be generations down the line. But if an atonement is made or if an apology is offered, then that's that. And so when we were filming again, then Tagak was still, you know, going on about this, you know, the, what your grandfather wrote about my people influenced the way that people saw us for, you know, the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Gerald offered a... a unequivocal apology on behalf of the uh, the Dickens family. And Tagak said, well, he says, Ken, Tom, you're welcome. If you're in Nunavut, you're welcome to come and visit and all. And he says, and, and you, Gerald, as well, you are welcome in Nunavut any time. And he sort of looks a bit sheepish and says, well, if, if you're ever in Kent. <laughs> so, but it what was so beautiful. Story. What a wonderful story, Tom. That's because amazing. then they 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 hugged each other. Oh wow! I don't think it was a dry eye in the bloody house. Of course, um, of course. it still brings a lump to my throat thinking about it, and a yeah. tear to the eye. So I took a photograph of the two of them together with their arms around each other, and it was just so sweet and full lovely. circle, full full circle. Yeah, and it was like closure. It was like. That old wound had finally been closed and was gone, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a remarkable experience. Speaking, speaking of closure, uh, although he was um, ostracized by British establishment, uh, you've made reference to just what people on Orkney feel about John Ray. Mm. And upon his death, uh, can you tell us about... Uh, you know, the, the funeral procession and the way the native Orkneyan was received, because uh, he was living in London when he died. Uh, and he's he was brought back to Orkney. Yeah. <clears throat> mm, he was living in um, Fort Addison um, Place mm. uh, in London. And he died on the 28th of July, uh, 1893. So it was just a few months short of his 80th birthday. Uh, he died of an aneurysm. He'd been ill for a wee while, and uh, but then died. It was very touching, the fact that his wife said that they always slept together holding hands. You know, there was a real tenderness between him and, and his wife, Kate. And he had left no instructions as to what to do after he died. 
uh, he just said that he wanted his funeral to be cheap, you know, because he didn't want some big old singing, old dancing with a massive memorial and all that. He said, just how very <laughs> Scottish of him, Tom. How very Scottish. <laughs> that is just English propaganda, Bill. I know, yeah. <laughs> Come to Orkney and we'll show you hospitality. Oh, indeed you will. But anyway, the, um, uh, she decided that he should be buried back home in, in Orkney. So um, his body was, there was a small private service for family only. It was basically, you know, Kate and her sister. And maybe one or two people were there and then when they left that little chapel, which was near Addison Gardens, um, the, um, the line was, the, the road from it was lined by members of the Royal Geographical Society who had come to pay their last respects. And um, the body was brought north on the last but the voyage was on the paddle steamer of the St. Magnus. And it arrived at Kirkwell Pier. And, uh, sorry, my clock. So he had arrived at Kirkwell Pier and the council had said that um, it would be nice if shopkeepers closed the shops for the funeral. But they had no authority to, to make them do that. But every single shop closed and the blinds were drawn on all the shops up the main street of Kirkwell. And the coffin was carried from the pier in Kirkwell up the main streets and up to St. Magnus Cathedral where the service was held. And then he was buried outside in the graveyard. Um, at St. Magnus Cathedral. So he's buried in Kirkwell. There's a magnificent memorial that was put up to him the following year, uh, paid for by public subscription. And it's, it's a wonderful um, memorial showing him reclining, lying sleeping in the Arctic with his, uh, his caribou skins and his gun alongside him and a book. He always carried books with him which he would have to stick under his jacket to defrost at night so that he could open the pages to read. So uh, Shakespeare was one of our favorite. Memorial to visit in St. Magnus. Mm -hmm. It's a very moving piece. And uh, we, you know, when we're there with Adventure Canada, we also visit uh, John Ray's grave. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, St. Magnus itself is just a, an amazing feature in Kirkwall. Uh, it just, uh, I think that's the, the story of his burial and the ceremony really speaks to the people of Orkney and how, how they yeah. held John Ray yeah. in, in a mm. so it's something we share. I, I should have said that the, the bells of St. Magnus Cathedral tolled as well as the coffin was being carried up the streets with all the shops closed and all the cut, all the blinds down and, and that bell, just one bell solemnly tolling the whole way up to the cathedral. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, he was held in a, a huge amount of respect. Was there not another uh, memorial done uh, in the 200th anniversary of his birth? Uh, there was a new um, piece put up in, in Stromness, was it not? Yeah, just a few hundred yards from where I'm sitting, actually, there was uh, a bronze statue of him was, was put up uh, at the pier, at the head of the pier in, in Stromness. Uh, and a little plaque as well, um, saying that he had discovered the last navigable link in the Northwest Passage, which hasn't gone down very well with some um, historians, or well, at least one anyway, in Canada, um, because um, he never actually claimed to have discovered that, but he knew, you know, I mean, Amundsen sailed it. Uh, it was the route that Amundsen took because Amundsen had read Ray's book and was inspired by him and did the same as he did, learnt from the Inuit how to survive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's well, the, the secret. I think that's one of the enduring legacies that, uh, you know, really has to be honoured. In Canada, mm. we, 
we're in a, um, a deep retrospective of our relationships uh, in culture and the history of colonialism. Uh, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat the, the situation, but uh, because, you know, as we said at the outset, ultimately these explorations were still in the name of uh, cultural expansion and imperialism and colonization. But Ray really stands out as an individual with a different set of values, a different set of behaviors that I think has enormous relevance today in the way he was able to accept, understand, adopt, uh, try and um, work with uh, a culture he was encountering uh, rather than dismiss it summarily the way so many indigenous cultures experienced around the world as, oh, yeah. as a result yeah. of that experience of error. So what, what, what else do you feel is Ray's legacy in terms of, um, you know, his life and uh, his experiences and what he has taught us 207 years later, we're, we're still talking about him. Mm. You know, <clears throat> um, I think that it's, it's maybe kind of stating the obvious really, but um, I think that uh, if you are looking for, um, a way of living your life, then I shall slightly clean this up from what I normally say is don't be an idiot. Um, so treat people as people because that's what they are. It doesn't matter a damn what color their skin is. It doesn't matter what they look like. Um, People are people and they have to be respected as themselves. We're all unique, we're all different. And Ray recognized that. And um, so, I mean, he wrote quite a lot about uh, the Inuit as well, their culture and um, customs and way of life and he always writes in great admiration of them because he knew that if people had been living in a place for tens of thousands of years they would have picked up a trick or two that a european yeah. would have no idea about of course, and of course. he was keen to learn from them so you know be respectful learn from others and that's what he did and that's why he was so successful i mean yeah. this guy charted 1,751 miles of Arctic coastline. He traveled over 13,000 miles in the Arctic, either on foot, about half of that was done on foot, uh, the other half in small boats and, and canoes. Um, he was quite a unique character, so yeah, yeah just... Don't be well, no, I really, I really appreciate your time today. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you and hear your stories and uh, your historical references and understanding. It's, it's a great pleasure. And, and I, I want to reiterate that uh, what you just said in terms of people are people. You certainly experience that when you do visit Orkney. Every visit I've had uh, to Orkney and time in Kirkwall, I've always run into the most pleasant people there and. They, they have an accepting uh, nature to them that is really wonderful to experience. And uh, we're very excited that we're going to be traveling with you again in, in 2021 mm -hmm. on the Scotland Slowly program mm -hmm. and um, in the North Atlantic so uh, Saga. So, um, you know, people will get a chance to visit uh, the Orkney and, uh, and Kirkwall and see some of these uh, sites we've talked about today. So. Tom, with, uh, you know, with uh, fondness to maybe get together again and chat soon, I, I bid you farewell and thanks again. Folks, if, uh, if you want to join in the conversation, we, um, Tom will be online for answering your questions. And I certainly encourage you to visit orkneology.com and explore more of uh, Tom's storytelling and perspective on uh, as an Orkney Islander. Tom, thank you and have a great day. Thank evening. you, Ben.